Okay, let's get serious. <laughs> you know, it's real hard for me to not get up and, and you know, talk about something that is so in our face. Uh, again, it bothers me when things happen. And, you know, I feel sorry for so many people in our world. You know, bad things are happening and people are just freaking out and they don't have no way to process what's going on. They want answers and they can't find answers and they go to the people that should have answers for them and they don't have any answers so people don't know what to do. And when I see that it, it really it really bothers me that <clears throat> there's so much darkness still in this world. Of course that's how the Bible describes it. I mean you know, God gave us the Word of God for a reason. There's a reason it's this thick. There's a lot of information in here. You want to know what life is all about? You know, people have philosophized about that for centuries. None of this is on my lesson. I'm just, I hope I can pull myself back. But I do want to make this point, you know, there is a reason for this life, this world. This whole world, the Bible says, is in darkness. Jesus said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famine, pestilence in various places. And we see that. There was an earthquake the other day in Mexico, and a whole bunch of people got killed. Uh, but, you know, once again, we have another senseless killing of you know, kids at school and the people are all upset. Here in Luke 13, when the Jews came to Jesus and said that Pilate had done killed some of the Galileans and mingled their blood in their own sacrifices. These people were offering sacrifices and for whatever reason, Pilate, the Roman governor, ordered them slaughtered for some reason and they came to Jesus telling him that they're upset his response is well do you suppose these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things I tell you no but except you repent you'll all likewise perish or those 18 he said on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwell in Jerusalem he said I tell you no but unless you repent you all likewise perish you know at Tower in Siloam, I've told you before, I had the opportunity with Dr. Uh, Don Patton, a lot of you guys know him, he was here once, to do excavations there at the Tower of Siloam. It's right outside the, at Temple Mount, you know, at the Gihon Spring. And, I, and the, the stones of the, of the Tower of Siloam are big as a Volkswagen, man. These are big, big stones, thousand, you know, a couple thousand pounders. And I asked him, I said, what do you think brought this thing down? He said, earthquake. Because, see, they always put a market where there's water. The tower was there to protect the water. You know, that's security. But people put their market all around. That would just be reasonable. It's like a lot of times you see, like, even in you know, different towns. The railroad tracks were by the rivers. Because the boats, the barges brought stuff up the river... And that's where the trains picked them up and took them in country. You know, there's reasons why people put stuff where they put stuff. The tower came down, and obviously being a whole bunch of people standing there, they got killed. And that's what Jesus is trying to say. Stuff happens, man. And it wasn't how they died. It was where, what state they were in when they died. You know, our hope is everlasting life. All people, all human beings... They want to live. People don't want to die. According to the Bible, God put that in our heart, that through the fear of death all our lifetime, people are subject to bondage. And the only way that people can overcome those... Why do people fear death? It's unknown. And they fear that unknown. Well, it's not unknown anymore once you get into the Word of God and God tells you what life's all about with dying. Physical death is a reality of this life. That's all. When people die, you know, our, our human bodies, are, they're, they're just made up of stuff that's in the ground. They can melt the body down and analyze it. It's just 
elements. It's just mineral. It's just calcium and magnesium and uh, potassium and a whole bunch of water. We're just a big bag of water. That's all. Where's all the creativity come from? It's the spirit of the man that's in there. And that don't die. That lives. That lives on. The Bible says the body don't have a spirit and it's dead. You can see examples in the Bible. The child was dying. Her spirit, you know, left her body. And Jesus raised Jairus' daughter back from the dead. It said her spirit returned to her body. When, when uh, uh, oh, not Rebecca, uh, was dying on outside Bethlehem, uh, Rachel was dying. It says her spirit was departing from her body. Where do, when the Bible says the spirit goes back to God who gave it. When David lost an infant son, when the child died after he was praying to God, the child wouldn't die, but the child died. David got cleaned up, desired to eat. You know, he, he wasn't mourning, and the servants were surprised. They go, how can you be like that? How come you grieve so when the child was alive, but now the child's dead? And you want to eat? Get back up, get back into business here? What's up? He said, how did I know that while the child was sick, maybe God would be merciful to me and allow the child to live, but now the child is dead? child can't come to me, but I can go to the child. Now, he said something. He said something. We know according to the scripture, human beings reach an accountable age. In the Old Testament, it was 20 years old when God held human beings accountable, the children of Israel. I call them children, but they were, that means his people. 20 years old. Below that, he said, they have no knowledge of good and evil. Not right and wrong, he said good and evil. That's what separates people from God. When they asked Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, he brought a child over to himself, and he said, you see this? Except you become converted and become as this child, you'll in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Those kids that got killed the other day were average, they're about 14. It was a junior high students. Okay? If the scripture teaches us anything, those children were innocent. One of the things I was reading the other day out of the Patriot Post that talked about this thing reminded people that the biggest school killing in the United States is still Bath Township, Michigan. 1927, when some crazy school board member put dynamite in the school and blew the whole school up. Fortunately, only half of his load went off. He, it would have killed more, but it, it, half the dynamite he put in there went off. Now, the point is, like Jesus is saying, stuff happens. These crazies, I mean the darkness in this world, wars and rumors of wars, earthquake, famine, pestilence in diverse places. The reason why I'm bringing it up, brethren, we need to be the people of the book that can give people hope at a time like this. I was saying, in fact, I think I said it after Sandy Hook, when those other little ones got, got killed, okay? I brought up Bath Township because the news brought it up. That still, that still holds the record. But that was 1927. That was 91 years ago. Chances are, I would assume, all those parents have, have passed on. They're gone. Okay? Did they go to their children? They could. Did they? Well, I don't know. God's not willing that any should perish. You see, those kids are alive. That's the whole point. Jesus said, God ain't the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Kids are alive. They're fine. This life here is short, man. We need to get there. We can. We can. Now, will these other parents, the Sandy Hook parents, or these parents, will they, will they be with their kids? They can. You know, that's our hope. This life is so messed up down here, man. We got to have hope. <laughs> if this is it, yeah, I could see somebody being real depressed about that. 
There is so much evidence that a person who's just got an inquiring mind, a truth seeker, who really wants to know, there's no reason for anybody any longer to huddle in the pale light of an insufficient answer to a question they're afraid to ask. Ask the question. These people don't know. The schools don't know. The universities don't know. People aren't teaching about the hope of the Bible, the gospel, of what this crazy life down here is actually all about. When you know the whole truth of the matter, believe it or not, it actually makes sense if you can believe that. You wouldn't think you could make sense of this life. Oh, yes, you can once you know what's really going on, big picture stuff. This world ain't it. And most people, even believe, unbelievers, don't think, how could this be all there is? You're right. It's not all there is. It's more. It's better. There's a lot of hope. I told you before, after that Sandy Hook thing, when I was watching Hannity, man, they had, oh, what's his, uh, they, he brought two guys on there, Father Jonathan somebody from the Catholic Church and Joel Holstein from, I guess, representing the Protestant churches, and he said, you got to give us some hope here, man. The whole country's hurting. You guys need to give us some hope. <laughs> Them two dudes sitting there looking with deer in the headlights, look. They had nothing to say. Mumble something about trust in God uh, or God's mysterious ways. Sounds like bumper stickers to me. They gave the people no hope. You, you, don't you think that maybe there's something in here that might deal with uh, life and death? And Once again, though, no, you see it, you see their faces on the news, grieving, grieving, not only parents, the whole city, the whole country. Where is the hope? The churches aren't giving it to the people because they don't know. It's not about religion, folks. We're going to have to help the people, you know, knees to knees, eyeballs to eyeballs. I'm talking about the kitchen table. I'm talking about those one-on-ones. I'm talking about the water cooler at work, the, the break room. This stuff is on people's minds. They make no sense of this. They're all trying to come up with solutions. This will solve the problem. No, it won't. <laughs> it's a spiritual thing. There ain't no politician, no legislation going to make earthquakes go away. Crazy people like Pontius Pilate offering the people as a sacrifice in their own their blood. That's never going to stop. Cain killed Abel, for crying out loud. This stuff ain't going to stop. Maybe other people don't care, but I noticed right after some of the local stuff, I mean here in America, but it also showed a market probably, I can't remember if it was Iraq or somewhere, or Assyria, a whole bunch of people blowed up in the marketplace. We don't pay attention to that because they ain't our country. They're people. They have lives too. They have kids. Oh. Easy. <laughs> don't you think they care about their kids? It's a global thing. And somebody has got to be able to explain it to people so that they can have hope. We're going to be gone from here a lot longer than we live here, and I don't care if you live to be 100 years old. Even those guys in the Old Testament before the flood that lived 800 years, 900 years old, man, I wish I, I don't, I'm glad that ended. I don't want to be here for 900 years. I mean, I hope to get to three score and ten if in a reason of strength, four score, then I'm out of here. Sue's dad's 94. He just stands there like a stick. He can't do nothing. In fact, he was standing there and his hip broke. He just toppled over. So they had to get him in, put a new hip in, and, you know, okay, well, he, you know, he's, he 
I guess they say he, would, he recovered. You would never know it. He still looks like a 94-year-old stick. Feeble. He's feeble. I mean, he's got his walker. I don't want to live to be 94 years old. <laughs> We're going to be gone from here a lot longer than 900 years. That's the hope. This is short. That's why God can allow. Remember the babies that got killed when Jesus was born. Herod sent soldiers down there because he heard this baby king was born. Well, he was, Herod was the king, and he didn't want no other kings around, so he ordered the soldiers to go down and find that kid. And if you couldn't find him, then kill all of them. That way you'll make sure you get them. From two years old and younger, it's in the Bible. It was prophesied in the Old Testament it would happen. And guess what? God sat right up there in heaven and let it happen. Well, why didn't he do something to stop it? He's got all them kids with him. God's like, a uh, problem? Do you see a problem here? Uh, well, Lord, no, I guess everything... You got to see things from his perspective. Them kids ain't dead. He's got them. Hopefully, he's got their parents too. Oh, because the parents understood why their child died so that that child could live. Jesus was whisked into Egypt by his parents, warned by God get him out of here before Herod gets to him. It's in the Bible. God can allow the darkness because the light is greater. See, we freak out over all these things because we think that's it. That's the end of it. No, it's not. You know. Oh, I got to move on. I mean, no, I'm sad about the whole thing. You know, it is a tragedy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's not something to be upset about. Even Abraham cried when Sarah died. Why, did he lose his faith or something? No, he loved her. He loved her. And he would miss her. Now, they've been dead 4,000 years. I don't think he's crying about that anymore. Because he's with his wife, Sarah. And they've been together for a long time. So everything's fine. She died at 127 years old, but he died at 175. He lived quite a while without her. But he's been with her now for, like I said, thousands of years. Yeah, about 4,000 now. Because Moses is 450 years after Abraham and we had 1,500 years of law until Jesus came, and Jesus came and went 2,000 years ago, so you do the math, about 4,000 years. I think they're fine now. I think he got over that. He, okay. My point is, I'm not minimizing. They love, every, you know, th we don't want that stuff to happen. We don't. Not only that, but other stuff that happens in this crazy world. Okay, let me go here. Um, see if I can bring it back. Well, maybe this is just a good segue. What I wanted to talk about is a crossroads. A crossroads. Every person... I, I would like to think without exception, I'm talking about people when they get older and they mature, they transition from the innocence of their youth into being accountable as adults. You know, a lot of young people starting out, man, when they first get their freedom, you know, they get to get out of the house, you know, and they think they got this world figured out. <laughs> no, you don't. Oh, you think you do. <clears throat> There's a Bible, the Bible does tell us there's a way that seems right to a man. Yeah, we do think we know what we're doing. We start right out of the gate, man, ready to, you know, make it happen, live life. 
and then reality sets in. Nothing turns out like you thought. Man, there's a whole lot of lessons learned if you'll learn them. You know, I know for me it was the 20s, you know, because I had my freedom, you know, and I started making all my mistakes that have consequences, serious consequences sometimes. You know, some people never get their head straight, their self straightened out. But my, I want to talk about those that actually really do want to have life and have life more abundantly. They want life to work. And even people that start out with all the best intentions, if it's not according to knowledge, if it's not according to God's eternal purpose for why he created the man and this world, we're not going to be successful all on our own. And we shouldn't even want to be in a sense because if life really has meaning and it's all by intelligent design, I want to know what's it all about so I can max it out, man. I want to max it out. Trust me, being drunk every day for years and years and years is not quality of life. And smoking dope and acting a fool, as some people say, you cause yourself a lot of harm doing that. Easy. You, you learn some lessons the hard way. But... By the grace of God, we can come out of what is called the darkness and into the light. You know what I found out? That God wanted the, not only the same for me, he wanted a quality of life, a better life for me. He want, what I thought I wanted, God wanted more for me. I mean, really. I didn't even, you know, never think about being rich or famous, but I just wanted some peace of mind. You know, have my basic needs met. I wanted to have a, a family and, you know, just simple things, I guess, and not a lot of regret, a lot of grief. You know, God tells us in the Old Testament in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, Your thoughts ain't my thoughts, and your ways ain't my ways, saith Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But yet the New Testament teaches us what God intends for us is to bring us around to where our thoughts and his thoughts do line up and our ways and his ways do line up. And that's what starting all over again, being born again, is actually all about. We can come out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. Now, there's things that are going to happen in people's lives. Now, I, I mentioned crossroads. People reach a point in their life where there's, they got to make a decision. You see, first off, in order to make a good decision, make good choices, you got to have good information. If you're out there flying around by the seat of your pants, you'll probably find out real quick your life isn't going to work out very well. You can't just make it up as you go. You need to little, be a little bit more goal-oriented, you know, purposeful. And some people learn that real young. And, you know, they look to education, which is good. You want to be educated. Now, education comes in more than just formal. There's informal. But you've got to be willing to learn. And you start to learn that you need to do what you need to do, and not just so much what you want to do. So you really have to become thoughtful. You've got to be purposeful. You've got to be a true seeker. Now, that doesn't mean, yes, in Scripture for sure, but I mean a true seeker in anything, even in products and advertising. You know what I mean? A fine print, because there's where the deceptions are at. You need to be a true seeker and want truth and love truth. When it's your life, well, how much is it worth to you? You know, that's another thing God does. He allows us to actually be able to see other people in their lives in action. You can see some of the things that other people do, and you go, gee whiz, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Maybe they looked at you and said the same thing. You know what I mean? We can learn by other people's mistakes. You know, the Bible tells us, uh, well, it's biblical, obviously, uh, you know, but in uh, Deuteronomy 12, 
God wants to set apart a special people, it's Israel, for his purposes. But he tells them that he's going to take them to a place you know, setting them apart. Now, it'll be obviously in the land of what we know as Israel today or Jerusalem. But he says, you will seek the place, I'm in Deuteronomy 12 and 5, where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes. He says, he's going to take you to this place. But he says in verse 8, you shall not at all do as we're doing here today. Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. God's going to lead them into a relationship and into a place with him where their lives are going to be very orderly and instructed by him for their good, that they may live and inherit the blessing that God intended for them. He said, we're not going to do have everybody doing whatever seems right in their own eyes. Now, if you jump ahead, you go Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. It's the very last book in the book of Judges. And it says something here. Very last verse, verse 25. And in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That is not going to go well. Everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. In other words, God says, look, I'm going to give you a standard. My thoughts, your thoughts ain't my thoughts, he said. Your ways ain't my ways. My ways are higher. They're good. Good. You know, you talk about getting good advice sometimes. Well, that's what you want, good advice. You want examples that you can actually follow. When you're putting your life together, when you're making decisions, choices, I know we talked about that book. I think that kind of floated around here. Some of you guys all were reading that Carolyn Leaf, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, about switching on your brain. Now, she's a believer, and she's also a neuroscientist or something, knows all about how the brain works and they've learned since the 1970s that the human physically the brain can change and depending on the thoughts that enter the brain because the thoughts produce various uh, physiological responses with chemicals be you know it's like fear if all of a sudden you get scared you know an adrenaline shoots into your bloodstream you know fight or flight you're ready for action Jackson you know moving out or fear or this or that you know or uh, anger your body actually stuff happens in there all in the brain and you know and they see that there's things you know toxic toxicity and thoughts that are full of uh you know negative thoughts hatred uh or whatever that you could think powerful emotions trigger these kind of things okay so but what she said is that choice, choice is the most powerful thing in all the known universe next to God himself. And guess who gave us the choice? God himself. And guess who else he gave it to? The Bible says angels. Angels, imagine that, who are greater in power and might than human beings have choice. And some chose very badly, according to the scripture. They rebelled against God. And now, according to 2 Peter 2 and also in the book of Jude, angels are in chains of darkness waiting the judgment of the great day. One third of the angelic realm caught up in that, which has a lot to do with why the earth was created, but I ain't going there right now. But human beings were also created with choice. God said, I set before you good, evil, Life, death. Now choose life that you may live. Choose. <clears throat> Guess what? As I said, even about the tragedies. The kids are fine. What about their parents? Well, the parents are going to have to choose. <coughs> Where, those of us present in this room here today, I don't think anybody would be shocked by this revelation. We're all going to die. All of us, it happens to everybody. It's pointed unto a man who wants to die, then the judgment, the scripture says. Okay, physical death, part of the way of all the earth, no problem. And you have no say in that, by the way. You don't get to, you don't get to choose. It happens. It will happen. But then what happens? We leave. 
The spirit goes back to God who gave it. Now, according to Scripture, it goes to be judged. He, Paul said, we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive it for the deeds done in the body, good or bad. New Testament. Old Testament says in the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, here the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, good or bad. No problem. Who gets to decide where we spend our eternity then? With God and holy angels and everlasting life and glorious new bods, as the Bible says, or outer darkness where there's weeping, gnashing of teeth, where the worm dieth not and the fires never quench. Who gets to decide that? We do. God gives you that choice. Where do you want to live? He asked him in Ezekiel 18, Why will you die, O house of Israel? He said, I don't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. Why don't you turn and live? Why don't you do what I say? Why don't you keep my commandments? Do that which is lawful and right. You will surely live. You won't die. He ain't talking physically. He's talking about your eternal soul. Surely live and you won't die. He said, I don't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. Peter says, God isn't willing any should perish. So just like Dr. Carolyn Leaf said, she realizes choice is the most powerful thing in all the known universe. And we are free will moral agents who can choose life that we may live. You know, I think uh, Blaine shared it in his stewardship I was going to use it too. It's right at the end of John 6. You know, those guys, the apostles, were following Jesus because he selected them. And they're following along. He's doing the teaching. He's doing miracles. And they're really kind of basking in that glow of that bright light. Uh, and they were somebody, man, because they were in on the in crowd. And then he actually, in uh, uh, Matthew uh, chapter 10, he actually gave them power as he sent them out, scattered them out a little bit, said, go out and come back, you know, uh, gave them power. They could actually do miracles, including Judas Iscariot. Think about that. Jesus said, haven't I chosen you 12? One of you is the devil. But yet he gave Judas Iscariot the same power, sent them out. Man, they were somebody. They were somebody. Then he started teaching stuff that people did not understand. It was blowing their minds. He started talking about eating his flesh, drinking his blood, and people were like, man, what's he talking about? <clears throat> How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said, that offend you? What and if you should see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? Boy, that'll blow your mind. He he didn't say that part. <laughs> but you can see that's what, it blew their minds. <clears throat> the apostles probably felt like fools because everybody was walking away. Everyone was walking away, wouldn't walk with Jesus anymore. So Jesus looked right at the 12 and he goes, well, how about you guys? You going to go away? And Peter said, so where are we going to go? We know two things. You're the Christ. You have the words of eternal life. But this other stuff you're talking about, we don't have any idea what you're talking about. Again, a little paraphrase on my part. You, I mean, I guess you had to be there. But you can see from the context that was what was going on. They did not know what he was talking about. And he didn't explain it either. It would be explained later. But he asked them flat out, you guys going to go away too? Peter said, where are we going to go? You see, they were at a crossroads. Some people made their choice. We're out of here, man. This guy's nuts. Peter said, we ain't going anywhere. We're going to stay right here until the movie comes out. And then we'll know how it ends. <clears throat> We try to sort out our own lives. We try this, we try that, we try this, we try that. Nothing's working, nothing's working until we finally go, you know what? God help me. 
what do I need to do? I, I mean, everything I touch, it, it's not working out, Lord, not like I thought. Now, whether you're outside or inside, sometimes, uh, you know, people have to go through this process. And, and you know what? <clears throat> That's really a good place to be sometimes, is at the bottom of a hole. Because then you feel like, you know what, I can't go any lower. All I can do is go up. And, you know, that is a good place to be. When I did Marge's funeral the other day, Sister Marge, you know, I used some of the same scriptures out of Ecclesiastes to set the context. You know what Moses said? It's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of, house of feasting because he said the living will lay it to heart. You know, if you, if you get that, if you understand that, it, it's a lot of truth in that. We can't just go through life wanting to party all the time. I don't mean, you know, in whatever way you party. I mean, I'm just saying, uh, if you're, you know, <laughs> I know both sides of the tracks on that one. So neither one, you know, we can't make jokes all the time. We can't always be laughing all the time. Dustin Ader, do me a favor. Go shut that kitchen door. That light is hitting that parked car out there, and I'm like looking at the Lord looking in the windows here. <laughs> It's brighter than the noonday sun. I mean, I can't see it. I don't know if that shows up up here or not. <clears throat> we get to that point where we realize this ain't working, man. Something ain't right. But so we can't make any real good decisions to make life changes unless we have good information. This is where the journey begins. This is a quest. Again, no longer huddling in a pale light of an insufficient answer to a question we're afraid to ask. Ask the question. Ask the question, why is this like this? What am I supposed to do? And be ready, if you're going to ask the question, accept the answer if it's the truth. And obviously, if you go to the Lord for your answers, you will get the correct answer. Don't just go down and ask your buddies. You know, they, they talk about jailhouse lawyers. You know, you get the idea. You know, those guys are in jail too. You know, if they knew so much about the law, why are they in there? So don't trust their counsel necessarily. Uh, see if it's so. If they're quoting law books, we'll go get the law books and look. Scripture's the same way. Be as those noble Bereans. Search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. See? If they are, accept them and do them. God here to help us. He ain't trying to kill us. So, you can't make good decisions if you don't have good information. So let's get the good information. It's not what we think sometimes. There is a way that seems right to us, but it doesn't work. We do need God's ways. We need his understanding. He'll tell us why this world's set up like this and how we can navigate through the storm, through the darkness, and how we can have hope, how we can arrive at the destination we actually really want to be. We want to live. The scripture describes us as pilgrims and strangers, just foreigners, just passing through. And our lives here are very temporary. But we don't want to waste the time. The Bible tells us redeem the time. The days are evil. We've got we to gotta get the most out of every day that we can. We've got to start now. No time like the present. <clears throat> Sometimes reaching that crossroad to begin that journey, it'll be at a time of, of great consternation or stress. Now, whether that's something that happened to you or is happening to you or something we create in our own mind because we know something's not wrong or something's not right it's, and we're hurting. Like I said, for some of those folks, you know, that what happened with their, you know, their kids and stuff last week, uh, they're, they're really hurting right now. And maybe they know... They ain't never going to be the same again. Because how can they? They'll think, I'll never, 
I'll never be able to be happy again. Well, that's not true, but uh, they would believe that at the moment. A house of mourning. See, they were thrust into a house of mourning. It's not a house of feasting where they're at right now. But it says it's better to be there because the living will lay at the heart. That means it's a time to think. It's a time to figure this out because we must go on. We have to find meaning and purpose in our lives. It's there. It's there. God is good. This is the whole point. It gets darkest before dawn, as the old song used to say. I believe that to be true. I used to stand watch many hours late at night out on the fence line in Guantanamo, and it would be pitch black out there and right before dawn, see. Then you could see the sky starting to light, get light. We need, if that, we don't want that stuff to have to happen to us to get serious, to start asking the right questions, to get out from the pale light of an insufficient answer, walking through life willy nilly with our fingers stuck in our ears and our eyes shut. That's a heck of a way to be forced to have to look for deeper things. Let's look in the green tree. When things are not falling down all around us, let us consider our ways. How's this working for us, life right now? If it's not sufficient, if something's missing, then ask the questions. I'll give you this little story. I think I've said it before, but <clears throat> there's a certain liberation or euphoria associated with coming to a point in your life when you make the decision that this is it, man. I am not living like this anymore. Now, I've experienced it a couple times in my life, and I know that feeling, and it's, it's not a feeling that, or a place that you can get very easily. I've told you before, you can't be laying on a hammock, sipping on an iced tea, and deciding, today I think I will radically change my mind into something different. That is not happening. Like the crazy change guru, Anthony Robbins, likes to say, you can't change unless you have leverage. Leverage either happens to you, like what recently happened with the folks there mentioned, you know, that left them completely blown away and, and probably thinking they'll never be the same again, which means they have been changed by that trauma. Or you have to create it. And you can create it by just going down into your own powerful mind, your thoughts, and examining your life where you're at. You know, is things working out for you? Are you happy? Are you content? If not, why not? What do you need to do about it? Where are you going to go find out? Where are you going to look? See, do you start that process? When I was a kid, I told you the story, my old man was real abusive, but beat the crap out of me, my brother, my sister. We were just kids. My old man was beating me up. When, I mean, when I was, I, my first remembrances is my old man beating me up. By the time I was 13 years old, I hated that guy with a passion. He'd beat me and I wouldn't even cry because I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction. One night he came home from work drunk and he hit me. I'm sleeping. I'm in a bunk bed. He hits me right in the stomach and throws me out head first into the floor. Down the steps, he's working me over. Two, oh, two o'clock in the morning. I'm getting a beating from He's kicking me. He's got street shoes on. And I, I'm in my underwear. Then he throws me in the basement, tells me to spend the, I'll be spending the night down there in the basement. And he's going to come pick me up after school, 320, to continue this little get-together. I'm in the eighth grade. So in the morning, I go to school all day long. You think I could think about school and my studies? Are you kidding me? I walked through that school all day like a zombie, my junior high school in, in West Dearborn. He was going to pick me up. I'm looking at the clock. So I'm sitting there looking at this clock, 
and it's, I don't know, about 3 o'clock, and I know, you know, 20 minutes after the school's going to end, and I thought, I am not living like this. Anyway, I'm 13. I don't have a job. I don't have no money. I got nothing. But all of a sudden, I had peace. Because right then, I realized I am not living like this no more. I'm done. I'm free. So I got up in my classroom. Class was going on. I'm in the far corner, like I'm over here and the door's over there. I had to walk up in front of the whole class, get past the teacher. I'm, I got up from my desk. I put my coat on. I left my books, my, uh, my personal stuff like that. <laughs> I ain't going to need this stuff. I walked out. I'm walking up, and the teacher says, Steve, where are you going? And I said, I don't know. Walked right out the door. Walked out the door. Walked across Telegraph Road. Four lanes. I don't even think I looked. I just walked across the traffic. Doo, doo, doo. Oh, down into some street, down in some vacant lot, and I sat down. I waited till about six, knowing my old man would be, had to go to work at the Detroit Free Press. So I went back to the house. I walk in, and my sister goes, where have you been? Dad's going to kill you. I said, I don't care. So I comes in, and I'm starting to grab some old draperies my grandma had downstairs to use as blankets. And John, Brother John, he ain't here today. He goes, where are you going, brother? I said, I don't know. He said, can I go with you? I said, sure. <laughs> we were Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn for about three days. We're hanging out the Rouge River, man, you know, throwing rocks and, you know, going over to the paper stands along the Westbourne Shopping Mall and flipping the paper stands upside down, shaking coins out, going into Dunkin' Donuts and eating donuts, you know, three meals a day. Life was good, man. Skipping school, not in school. And then, you know, uh, a couple of days later, Johnny was out with some of our friends appropriating some things for us at a store, got caught, police had him. I didn't know what happened to him. He never came back. And a few days later, the police got me. They locked me up and him for almost two years. My point is, when I walked out of that class, I, I wasn't old enough to have a credit card, a driver's license. No, I had no place to go in this world, and I did not care because I was done with that life. Now, it takes a lot of faith, if you will, to like Abraham, when God called him to get up and go, leave everything, and I will show you the place. And it says he got up not knowing where he was going. Like I told the teacher, Steve, where are you going? I don't know. I didn't. And I also didn't care. Now, I was happy, don't get me wrong. I felt liberated. I mean, it was a euphoria that I felt because I made a decision that I am not living in that environment like that anymore. Now, you know, of course, you know, my life, it, it, it did change. I mean, I never went home again. I mean, I got locked up, got sent over here, ended up adopted over here by a guy, a stranger, Jim Doty, John and I, into his own house. I mean, so life did change. And, you know, it's, it's had its ups and downs and various other things. But my point is the realization that we have to get to a crossroads where we have to take inventory and we have to decide, are you satisfied? Is this where you want to be for the rest of your life? Is there something missing? Don't settle for that. Find out. Do not huddle any longer in that pale light of an insufficient answer. This life is tough down here. And bad things are happening, and people are really, really struggling when we know the whole truth. Jesus said that you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It'll set you free, he said, from your old man. <laughs> it set me free from my old man, that was for sure. But I had another old man. It was the one in here that I had to be set free from, and so does everybody else. And boy, I'll tell you what, sometimes you've got to go through a real choke point there, a real intense pressure cooker before you can come out the other side victorious. And you're not going to do that if you don't know where you're going. You've got to have the truth. 
that highway of holiness that God will show you that new life that we can have abundantly. And then you'll hear that voice on that last day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You'll realize you've bingoed. You figured it out. You found the truth. The truth set you free. And now you can live forever. And I want to see all those kids that didn't get through their school the other day and all those little kids from Sandy Hook and all the other innocent people and those who were made innocent in the blood of the Lamb. That's where I want to spend my eternity. God bless you, and that's where we all need to get. Thank you for your attention this morning.